And tonight is actually the last in our kind of winter spring lecture series. Um, this one actually got rescheduled from a few weeks ago because of snow, so we're really happy to have it tonight, even though the weather is you know, just about as good as it was last time. Um, so Ben Betty Stopson is here. He is the transition manager at Stonehouse Farm, which is up in Livingston in Columbia County. Um, and so he's managing the organic transition on this uh, farm. So he's here tonight to talk about soil regeneration. Um, and yeah, let's give him a round of applause. Hi, how are you all tonight? Um, as you know, my name's Ben, and uh, about two years ago, I was hired to um, help start thinking about an organic transition uh, at Stonehouse Farm, which is a 2,200-acre a grains and uh, beef operation in Columbia County. Um, it's about an hour north of here, um, and it's about four miles east of the Hudson River, so sort of on a higher shelf. It's sort of rolling flat land. And for the past 30 years, the farm has been a conventional corn and soybean farm with a little bit of wheat, and they would just stock the pastures with, um, with feeder cattle. Um, but their farm went through a generational shift. Uh, the farm was the, actually it's compiled of six farms that were put together during the farm crisis of the late 70s and early 80s by Peggy, Peggy Rockefeller. And her three children, Abby, Peggy, and David Jr., uh, three, three of her six children, decided to take on the farm. And their one major point of consensus at the outset was that they wanted to convert it to organic. Um, they hired me at the point where that's what they knew. And we spent a year uh, planning and thinking about the options and the, what, would, what the ramifications would be depending on what route we took. Um, so we spent a year meeting with other farmers, landowners, people in the food business in our area. Um, we we're very sensitive to not wanting to do something that would negatively affect the impact other farm businesses in the area because of the scale of the farm. And we wanted to find a way, the most economical way, to rejuvenate the soils, um, which has really become the core of our, of our work, has been understanding the soils, understanding the past, um, understanding the geological base of the soils, and understanding what their potentials are. Um, so what we decided after, after a whole year was to keep, continue growing grains, but to diversify into several small grains and continue growing some corn and soy to meet the demand for locally produced non-GMO and natural animal feeds. As many of you probably know, or maybe all of you know, there are a lot of smaller farms coming back into Hudson Valley, especially with a lot of younger folks raising pastured poultry, some, uh, some pork, some um, some laying hens and some people are raising sheep and goats and, and some small dairies are coming back. So what we've, what we've had a very good luck with and good success with has been make, mixing our, the grains we're growing into um, non-GMO natural animal feeds. We're selling some barley to local malters and we're selling some wheat to um, Wild Hive Mill and some to a couple mills up in Vermont. So that's just a little background on what we're doing and, and where we are. But what, um, what I wanted to start with was a picture from the fa uh, fall of 2013 where we were just coming out of the last harvest of conventional soy and corn and what was on the right was a, little, was a wheat field where we had, had a small amount of wheat that was harvested in July which gave us an opportunity to plant a blended cover crop and on the left let's see this was just just harvested soy and um, it had some wheat drilled in, but you can't quite see it. But it gives you a very big contrast of in the initial shift to organic or natural soil management from conventional. Most conventional fields around here are left bare for the winter. So your a crop is planted, it's fed its synthetic nutrients, uh, which are still delivered by clay colloids and uh, humus in the soil, which in a conventional system is usually depleting. Uh, but in an organic system, the fundamental the fundamental, you know, most important part of our fertility program are cover crops and the general philosophy that land should have living roots in it at all times, if possible. So what we did to start the transition was plant this blend of cover crops, which is a mix of grains, oats, winter rye, vetch, and legumes as well, um, which were vetch, some winter kill peas, and also we uh, mixed forage radishes, forage turnips, and pearl millet in. And the idea was that in a soil that was very immature biologically and, um, and in need of, of decompaction, 
in need of more diverse soil life and um, the best thing to do would be to plant a diverse mix of plants that would create a diverse a lot of relationships with a wide array of uh, soil bacteria and soil fungi and um, so this is just I wanted to give you an idea of what it looked like at the start and what we did is we're breaking out of a rotation of corn and soy which is sort of the predominant agricultural rotation in America one year you grow corn the next year you grow soy and these this tends to deplete the soil of most a lot of most micronutrients and it also doesn't give the soil really time to to rejuvenate so our um, we have we moved out of our corn and soy rotation into a wheat corn soy and other legume back to barley or oat so it's sort of a four and six year rotation and we're taking a lot into account um, we we take into account economics but most importantly we look at the nutrient cycles um, we know that corn is a heavy feeder so we like to follow you know, plant corn after a small grain small grains mature in July and we're given a nice window late July into August to plant a cover crop and then we have the rest of August September and part of October for that cover crop to continue to grow and if you use a lot of legumes you're able to make a big enough cover crop to provide most of your nitrogen you need for a corn crop the next year um, we all, and the, the real importance of a rotation is also trying to, and these cover crops, is trying to mimic nature. If you think of a forest, we don't fertilize the forest. The soils tend to be much healthier, they're stable. And in our system, we're really are trying to emulate that with a diverse mix of cover crops. Also minimum tillage, which is something we're gonna get into a lot here, um, is our emphasis on not tilling. Every time you turn soil or expose it to the air, you release carbon, you affect the, the biology of the soil, particularly the fungi, which are very um, which are very susceptible, susceptible to soil disturbance. And um, so a big part of our philosophy is to have a diverse rotation um, that's based on the subsequent crops and our long-term goals, and to sequester carbon dioxide and build organic matter. Um, organic, the more organic matter we have in our soil, the more water holding capacity, and um, the better the better home we can create for bacteria crucial soil microorganisms that cycle our nutrients. So I'm going to move to a next picture here. Oops, I'm sorry. This is a picture just of a barren field right before our start, um, which is sort of what most of Columbia County actually looks like this time of year. Um, and then this, is a, this next picture is a picture of an adjacent field that we had time to get a cover crop on. And I'm going to pause this if I can. Oops. Um, ah, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> here it is. OK. So this picture right here is a picture of a field that's cover cropped with a diverse array of plants in the spring. And I want to move forward to a to there we go okay so I wanted to show you here this is a, a even better picture of what most of our farm looks like in May um, most of the farm is planted to blended cover crops this one was planted for corn and the I, the purpose of this cover crop was to mine nutrients I get as many available nutrients out of the ground and into the, these plants their roots and their stalks um, and the other as you can see all this sort of furry, darker green, that's a hairy vetch, which is our major nitrogen fixer for the corn crop. And um, this picture, I'm going to move forward to one more picture to show you um, what the rolling crimping, this is on an adjacent field, but this is what we, we've, we're using a system of organic no-till, um, and I'd like to backtrack a little bit. In, in our decision to go organic, we were coming from a conventional no-till system on the farm. And in conventional no-till, it's arguably a better system than conventional tillage farming because you're at least not disturbing the soil. There's still a lot of pesticides and herbicides involved, but you're no longer tilling the soil. So we wanted to continue with as much no-till as possible in order to continue the trend that the, the conventional no-till system had shown that we farm was increasing in organic matter, but very slowly. So we adopted a system of um, organic no-till in which the, in those cover crops, instead of plowing them 
under the soil and re-exposing the soil to carbon. We grow the cover crops until they begin to flower and, and you know, when the rye is letting some pollen out and when the vetch is in over 50% flower. And then we use this implement called a roller crimper. And the idea is that you kill the crop, but you leave it on the surface of the ground. And the crop itself acts as a mulch that holds back your weeds. So when we roll and crimp, we're able to, we're able to prevent our tillage, and then we're able to plant right through that thick mat of cover crop. Um, and the, the cover crop holds back our weeds in the soil, and your crop, the crop comes up through a, sli a slice in the cover crop. And it worked very well for us. Um, where, we, where we had some till, for example, with soybeans, where we had open stubble in our first spring where there had been a corn crop the previous year and we had not had time to cover crop, we got inundated with weeds. Uh, and we had to cultivate many times, um, which cost us diesel and time, and it also weakened the soybean crop. But where we used the, the organic no-till system, we didn't have to cultivate the soybeans, and we got much better yields. So this, we feel, is a, a uh, it's sort of the linchpin of our farming system, and is to minimize tillage, and we're always thinking about our farm in, in, from a perspective of adding carbon and, um, and letting our cover crop cycle our nutrients for us. So the rolling crimping is, is how we're farming over half of the farm now. And um, yes? Does the roller crimping uh, kill the cover crop? It does. I'll explain how it does. It's, it's made of, uh, it's in a chevron pattern, which means a V of metal blades, and those metal blades are air space at six inch intervals. <coughs> the rollers themselves are filled with water to provide weight, and what it does is it, it breaks the cover crop stems every six inches, and it cuts down the vascular flow, but it doesn't cut the plant off, because often at if you cut a cover crop, mow it, it'll, it'll come back, it'll re-sprout. By doing this, the idea is that you keep the entire plant intact, and by not cutting off the bottom, you're able to kill it. We did get a little, uh, some rye re-sprouting, which I'll show you, but it didn't make viable seed. And, I'm sorry. Could you eat, could you eat that? This could be eaten. Um, well, not so much us people. No. We could, we could, we could save the rye. You know, for example, this was mostly rye. You could harvest the rye as a rye crop. You could also, some farmers would cut that and feed it to animals and then plow it under. But then you'd have much higher um, fertility needs. You'd have to buy more fertility inputs for your farm. So we're doing a mix of, we are we are definitely sacrificing this biomass for our crop, but we're also able to sequester a lot of carbon doing that. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. And how about the roots? Aren't the roots fighting each other? Like the corn that you're planting, isn't it being... Actually, actually, one, this system's really neat because the, the plant itself is breaking down on the surface and the roots of that plant are no longer active. So though all the or microorganisms that live on the cover crop roots, it's actually, we notice a better takeoff in the plants that, that went into their roots because it wasn't, they're not living roots. The new root is living and the other roots are dead and they're, they actually decay very quickly. And all of the microorganisms that had relate, you know, relationships with, with those cover crop roots, actually, it's it's they move over to the new roots. So the the fundamental philosophy of what we're doing is to try to keep a constant living root in the soil. And when you have living roots in a the soil, then all of the classes of, for example, mycorrhizal fungi, which are a crucial fungi for. Um, for, I'm sorry to get a, so wordy, but um, there's the, the mycorrhizal fungi are responsible for stabilizing carbohydrates that plants make in photosynthesis. So excess glucose and sucrose, um, if there are mycorrhizal fungi, they, the fungi grow into the root and they create a symbiotic relationship in which the plant feeds the fungi its excess glucose and sucrose made in photosynthesis. And then the mycorrhizae is able to mine and make available phosphorus that they can deliver to the plants. And it's very important because the mycorrhizal fungi exude those, that glucose and sucrose as a f substance called galamoin, which is a very flexible um, type of organic matter that can hold a lot of water and is generally stable. Whereas a lot of other root exudates, such as polysaccharides, that are, not, are also 
that don't go through mycorrhizae, but they're just, they come out of the root, they're quickly consumed and then re-emitted into the atmosphere often. So it's very important actually that it's a big benefit to actually be planting a new crop into those roots that have just died. Okay, no idea. So how much of this process in science that you're describing is new science, and how much is just going back to... Most of it's old science, and it's sort of where we've looked at it. It's a very good question. Um, the roller crimper was brought to, it was um, developed in South America, um, where they have very thin soils, and they often, if you, you know, if you cut down rainforests and you still treat the soil right, you often only have a five or six year window to farm that soil. So they, so some farmers there have started using cover crops and a roller crimper in common. Some, there's some organic now, but at first they would roll and crimp a cover crop and then use an herbicide just as a way of holding the soil surface and then we plant into that. Um, at the Rodale Institute, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Um, it's in, uh, it's in, how is it? Could, near Kutztown, Pennsylvania. It's, it's actually Siegfriedville. Um, it was formed by J.I. Rodell, an early pioneer in organic farming. And they have a long, an ongoing organic and conventional trial for corn and soybeans. It's the longest standing set of trial in America. Their, their main farmer, Jeff Moyer, brought the roller crimper to America and really perfected the, the system at Rodale. And then six or seven years ago, um, they did a project with seven universities around America, and that really brought the idea of the roller crimper to the fore. So I went and visited him. And then a lot of the science, for example, glomulin and mycorrhizal fungi, they were discovered by the USDA in 1996. So it's not a super recent discovery, but relatively recent. Um, and then a lot of the work we do is based on conventional knowledge of, of soil. And the area where I'd say we're, we're not necessarily pushing new frontiers, but sort of in the, you know, on the edge of new thinking is, I'd say, in, um, in soil microbiology, just trying to under, understand all the newest developments and what we can be doing to, to encourage a healthy system of new biology in our soil. Um, yeah? I believe it's fairly recent. Uh, we have a relation uh, that uh, the endophytes uh, mm -hmm. are critical in the soil and in making the plant work also? It's actually, that is one, and there are several others in that um, across, the, in, across agriculture, it's finally being realized that we, we can't pursue too many more chemical alternatives until we understand the soil life systems that deliver nutrients, um, and that in fact some of our herbicides are holding back the release of essential micronutrients and the ability of biology to live in our soil. Um, and then that itself is inhibiting our potential to take yields and, and further, and it's also inhibiting our plant nutrition in our own. Uh, but endophytes are something I, I don't know a whole lot about, but I just, with my boss, was just, she was just talking about them a bit. Uh, we are looking a lot at um, another, we, when I should back, I'm sorry I'm all over the place, but uh, we are looking a lot at also single-celled organisms like protozoa and nematodes. Um, when in a conventional farming, a long, long farmed conventional fields like what we're on, you end up with a soil with a very high bacterial population, very low fungal population, almost non-existent. And um, we have a high population of nematodes, but little diversity. And in order to bring our bacterial population down, we introduced a lot of protos protists, protozoa. They're a large single-celled organism that prey on bacteria. Um, Bacteria and fungi have a carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is a very important thing in agriculture, whether you're working with a cover crop or a compost or anything. Uh, whereas protozoa have a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's higher. When they eat bacteria, they exude the excess nitrogen as an, in an available form. So we introduced a lot of protozoa through our liquid planter. Um, and that was it, that was a, it really helped get our bacterial population lowered. To a, to a more stable level, and we're not, we couldn't quantify it, but we feel that it helped us with our nitrogen release. So I'm gonna move on to a couple other pictures to explain a little more, and then, um, then I'd like to field questions from everyone. Uh, give me one second here. Okay, so after rolling and crimping, this is the mat of cover crop. You can see some small green blades, and that was some rye 
that re-sprouted mostly, if you could imagine, the rye plant, and we rolled and crimped it. There were some sprouts that came right from that point where the, where the roots hit the earth. And we were very, very worried about it at first. This was our first season. Um, working with a crew who had managed the farm conventionally for 25 years, and it was, we were all, I was panicked for my own reasons, they for theirs. However, it came up pretty well. You can see the soybeans are merging from the row, and you can see there isn't dirt soil on either side. It's just really like a knife slice through the, through that mat. And that mat acts as a mulch, and the soybeans are able to go right into the, right into what was the root zone of the rye. This is the same crop about uh, four weeks later. And you can see that rye that re-sprouted had already died out. And we didn't get any viable seed in those heads. It made some sort of halfway type seeds. And some, and some of it were just empty pots. And then that's the crop when it was starting to, not, that wasn't at quite full size, but approaching, approaching full maturity. These are some cattle on the farm. And this is a crop of corn on the field where that picture of the roller crimper was. This is corn on that same field. And you can see some of the thatch down low and almost no weeds. And what, what we feel there's great hope in the rolling and crimping system. For example, the, the major input cost for this crop was the cover crop seed. We used a liquid starter, uh, which was fish emulsion, seaweed, and some rock dust powders, um, and also humates, humic and fulvic acids, which are uh, um, very important for helping stabilize nitrogen and also for creating a, a good pathway for fungal development in the soil. And um, our, we were able to produce our corn at a cost per acre that was lower than our previous conventional cost of production. And we're going to have to take some years to see if that data holds. Um, but it was very, very encouraging for us that we could have very little weed pressure, um, little low insect pressure, and and still grow a viable a viable crop. Yield our our historical yield on corn is 154 bushels on the farm per acre, and last year we yielded 137 bushels per acre. So our yield dropped a uh, little over 10 percent, um, but our cost was reduced by about 20 percent. So it was a major. Sir, go ahead. Was it organic? No, it was. Con it, it, we pr it, prior to my time, it was farm produced GMO corn and soy. So, but, but it was fertilized. Or? It was fertilized with synthetic right. synthetic nitrogen. So now you're bringing it back. Exactly, exactly. These are just a few more pictures of what what conditions were like when we started our. When we started our organic transition, you can see in the distance that um, uh, I'm sorry, this thing. You can see in the distance some cover crops greening up, and in the foreground we planted barley. But we that was sort of the look that we had to move out of into a living system. And this is back to our our, our start. So I'm going to let this sort of roll through, and um, I wanted to talk about a few other sort of guiding principles in our work and sort of our, some of our fundamental goals. Um, one, our, our primary goal is to, is sort of that of um, Peggy Rockefeller originally. She bought these farms during the farm crisis to, to sort of show a model of farming that could work um, economically. And she, I don't know if she fully succeeded in that, um, but we feel very strongly that we have, we have two issues to address. One is the economic viability of farms in our area, and the other is sort of a national scale ecological problem across our farm fields where we're producing food that, with nutrient density that's in decline, and we're producing food that's less and less, a less and less diverse supply of food. Um, our whole food system has become based largely on corn, soy, and wheat. And while we grow those crops, um, we're also starting to diversify into other grains, but in growing those crops, we want to show that if these are stable crops we're growing in America, we need to provide an economically viable model that's that's good for soil and produces a produces a crop that has less risks um, as far as herbicides and, and genetically engineered content. Um, another major goal of ours 
is to find a way in farming systems to sequester carbon dioxide. Um, the two largest potential sinks for carbon dioxide on, on this planet are our soils and our forests. And the UN has yet to recognize soils as a carbon sink, even though they could be the fastest responding carbon sink on the planet. Um, so we very much, we're starting this year a carbon monitoring project in which we monitor and document the carbon cycles on our farm. So it's pretty complicated, but it will be graphing, looking at our soil carbon increases periodically on some fields on a monthly basis. And we'll be looking at our soil carbon decreases after actions if we have to till because of too much weed pressure. We'll be watching what happens to soil carbon then. We're also trying to understand the intricacies of carbon dioxide in soil. Sometimes soil carbon will be high and then two months later it'll be lower and you haven't tilled. So we're gonna, we want to understand a lot about um, what the soil is respiring out. So we're undertaking this study with the hope that not only can we show a viable model of, you know, economically viable model of farming with organic no-till, but that we can, over the next several years, come up with a, um, a good date, a good baseline for understanding how much carbon dioxide we're sequestering. Um, with you know, we have 300 million acres of corn, wheat, and soy ground in America, and um, and we have a lot, hundreds, even probably 400 million of pasture land that is also due to mismanage and being depleted. So there are that's another aspect of what we're doing. Um, I don't have many pictures to, to talk about it, but we're starting to use a planned grazing program on our farm. And um, it's a system in which we're able to stock. We're looking at our, our pastures very differently. Um, traditionally, we've fenced off areas, put a certain number of cattle in it, or, or grazing animals, and let them graze that area. And we're moving to a system that mimics nature a bit more. We've had, if you think of all of our great grasslands around around this, this country and the world, they were areas where there were large groups of, um, animal, of uh, grazing animals, such as here, it was by buffalo through most of America, that traveled in large groups and being chased by predators. So if you think about that, they, they, heard, they moved in large herds that were dense, and they moved quickly because they were sort of surrounded by predators. By being in a large herd, their individual chance of being predated was lower, and but they were still moving quickly. And the effect of this is that they would eat the tops of plants, often trample the rest, and you get a thick distribution of manure and urine on the ground. And due to their migratory nature, they wouldn't be back to that ground until the plants had fully recovered. And often what happened is they recovered better than they had been before. Roots went deeper, plants grew higher. And over many millennia or millions of years, the soils got very deep. Now, since we've introduced the fence line across the America and Africa, and we have seen a rapid, rapid decrease of topsoil in all of our pasture land. So what we're doing, we are in an eastern deciduous environment where we get lots of rain. But for us, what this moving this way, what we're doing is to mimic the predator. We use temporary electric fencing. We keep our cattle in a tight group, and we move them frequently, and we don't move them back to an area until the grasses have fully recovered. And the, where it's helpful for us is that we can um, stock at a higher density of animals, and we're also able to improve our soil quality. The, this year, we're going to start incorporating animals onto our cover crop fields. So where we have these cover crops, Forms. I might need a little technical assistance here. Okay, here we are. As we were saying before, these cover crops provide a great amount of forage um, for grazing animals. So we're embarking on fence. We're starting to fence some of our crop fields in order to bring animals across our cover crops, which will give us an opportunity to. That's, uh, that one's fine, I can explain. So for example, this is a, a crop field where we have a cover crop that's set for a subsequent rolling and crimping and crop. 
But these cover crops are often at their luscious point in the fall and the spring. But they're often at their best in the fall when our regular pastures have, have become thinner. So we have an opportunity here to extend our grazing season on our cover crops and also bring animal manure and urine onto our crop field while also increasing gaining weight on our animals. So we're starting to look at how to overlap systems bringing animals onto our cropland just like nature has a mix of plants and animals um, to better distribute our nutrients and, and, um, and bring some of the biology that comes through a cow's rumen back, back to the soil. Um, Sorry, I feel like I'm wandering a little bit. I didn't know if I could stop and ask if anyone has any questions that I could answer. Or... What is, is, is it potentially going to be grains? Where, where, where are you putting the other things that you're grains? Oh, so these, you're expanding out to other grains. Uh, that's, that's mixed into the rotation. So I've, I showed pictures of the corn and soy to explain yes. the rolling and cripping. Right. After a soy crop, we, that's harvested in early October or late September. We plant rye or wheat or winter barley right after that. And then that crop is harvested the next year in July. And then after that, we're, we plant a cover crop uh, or another fall grain. So we have, it's, it's mixed, they're sort of mixed evenly into the rotation. So if a field was corn the year before, it was wheat or rye. So, so this is a to yes. Uh, and the we, farm is not uh, going to regenerate beautiful soil and then be uh, vegetables, right? No, no. We're, you could do that with vegetables, but vegetables feed on soils. Um, they feed much, they need much more nutrient than your average grain crop. They need nutrient more like a corn crop would need something because you produce a lot per acre. You know, vegetables may have a lot of mass. So this is going to be more self-sufficient. You're not going to have to go in and fertilize with a, 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 a lot of natural fertilizers. Exactly. We're, to start, we've used some natural fertilizer, but the idea is to actually mimic nature using blended cover crops like and animals forms. in order to, to mimic the nutrient cycles as best we can. And, and place our planting of crops when the soil is ready to hold them, so to speak. How excellent is that? Okay. Go ahead, sure. So, um, this uh, approach mm -hmm. with cover crops doesn't apply to many vegetables? Oh, it sure does. It sure does. I'm just saying for what we're, it absolutely does. Oh, what does. I was saying is in vegetables, since vegetables are heavier feeders, right. it's, it's often hard to, I have a long, I started out in vegetable farming. Um, and I find to, to farm this way where you're gaining soil carbon over the long run with vegetables, it's just often important to make a longer rotation. So if you have vegetables in the field, it's you know, usually, I was constrained for space in my farm and I grew vegetables on the same acre every year and I could get short cover crops in that weren't sufficient. Um, but that was often, that was due to sort of my economic situation. Um, but often you have a very good farm that's using a lot of cover crops in their vegetable rotation. There are lots of them up and down the Hudson Valley, but one that I go to a lot is uh, Roxbury Farm up in Kinderhook, New York, which is managed and run by John Paul Cortez and Jody Beloit. And they do a wonderful job of integrating. The, often their average rotation is one year of full rest in cover crops, and the next year they grow vegetables on their land. Uh, whereas our goal is to grow sort of a cover crop and a grain crop every year on the same acre. Um, although that, that, that's our, our goal. It doesn't mean we'll be able to do it. If the soil will really tell us. So. You had a question too? Well, no, it was the same okay. idea that I'm a novice gardener and, you know, I had a great tomato garden. Mm -hmm. So do I next squish it? Well, I don't plant tomatoes there. But I would say in that spot, I would definitely put something other than tomatoes. Right. Um, just to be. But whatever grows there, do I let it? You know, because I cleaned up my tomato. Mm -hmm. You know, I got rid of stuff. Yeah. As to it. There are several crops you could grow that would have, you know, some leguminous crops where you might get some peas or beans and also get some nitrogen in the ground. And then I would suggest making sure you get a cover crop in next year as well. And that way, crop like you could plant rye with vetch. You could plant Austrian winter peas and wheat. You could plant, if you want the ground to be not have anything living the next spring because you want to till it under for, you could do oats with, with peas. Um, 
there's there's so many options. It's but there's um, a very I don't know if you look if you use uh, Johnny's seed catalog or anything. They have a lot of just even their blurbs in the back explain pretty well some of their cover crop mixes and what outcomes you can get out of them. Um, and the Rodale Institute has a lot of great information on their website. This system I'm showing you, they're starting or people are starting to work with for vegetables, um, especially for larger because that mulch provides a great habitat for worms and insects. Um, a lot of people are usually using transplantable crops. So I have a friend who raises garlic in a no-till system. He has raised beds. He uses a small roller trimper on the front of his tractor and rolls the cover crops onto the surface of the raised beds. And then he made a cutting disc that cuts trenches in the, uh, into that mulch and plants his garlic. And then he doesn't worry about mulching because he's already rolled rolled the mulch down. So. Another question. What about you know composting? We have kitchen banana peels and all that oh, stuff that I grow in the garden. Is that I would compost it first, okay. but it's all really valuable material. For us, what we do, we have so much space, it's that it's we couldn't get enough manure to to make compost for the whole farm. And if we did, it would mean we were taking someone else's nutrients and sort of concentrating it on our farm. So our philosophy is to bring the grazing animals to the field. And I also work a lot with compost teas. Um, and the compost teas, I, one thing I haven't really visited upon is how we introduce micronutrients and, and biology and fungi we want to the crops. And we do that at planting. So after the rolling and crimping I showed you, that we go over with a large corn planter that we use. It's a 12-row planter that we use previously in, conven in the conventional system. And previously we put um, synthetic fertilizers in the starter tanks and fungicides on the, in the compartment that would spray the seed. And what we were doing now is I, the mycorrhizal fungi I mentioned earlier, we purchase spores of that and we apply that directly to the seed so that as soon as the seed root emerges, there's spores already on the seed that can grow onto the root and they can move forward with, their, with the symbiotic relationship. In the liquid fertilizer tanks, we use a compost tea extract. And again, when I was explaining how we applied protozoa, I tested several composts. Um, they're actually composts that had then been consumed by worms, so they were castings, for their level of protozoa and fungi, um, which are the fungi are the hardest to introduce to the soil so I wanted something that had a lot of fungi and I found a very good worm compost down in western New York and I had also made compost from the previous fall mixed with a lot of micronutrients and we use those in compost tea brewers which is um, it's kind of like a, a massive tea bag that holds 200 pounds of medium and we put that into a tank that has, is agitated by oxygen and through the tea bag there's a long pipe that blasts air out and pulverizes the compost in such a way where you really get all the solids that are too too small to to stay. They can get out of the bag, you know, and get they get out into the water. And that it, if you do it long enough, you get about ninety percent of all the organisms or their spores out into the water. And then I have four of those, and I put those into a master brewer that I inoculate with fish emulsion and molasses to breed the bacteria and fungi and expand their populations. Mm -hmm. And then, I do that at the very end of the process, and then we transport that to the field and load it into our planter. So when we're planting, I'm in the, I'm in the tea room. <laughs> and and um, it's been a really neat way to see that we can actually use most of the conventional farm equipment we have and, and modify it for this new system. Uh, go ahead. Um, how would you cover crop or cut it on a small scale? That would, that, it depends on what you're growing, but it's very easy on most scales. If you're in a garden, um, I would think through what you want to have. The first step of the cover crop is thinking about that space and your goal for it in the coming year or the coming two years. Mm -hmm. And then you backtrack from there to help decide what cover crop you want to do. For example, my mother farms an acre. She's a school teacher, but she farms an acre with her horses in the summer. And she has... She often, when, when she harvests the crop, she then just sprinkles the cover crop right on that bed or portion of a bed and rakes it in. Um, so the biggest part of your decisions are, are over time, observing what the weaknesses of that soil are. 
if you see that it steadily produces sort of smaller plants and the nitrogen isn't cycling very well, um, and you've got you yellowing leaves, then I would suggest a lot of legumes. But my, the main thing I would suggest is a cover crop blend. And the idea there is that you're blending, once you get over five or six um, species, you're putting the diversity on the ground and, off, and if you have a mix of legumes and oil seeds, deep-rooted plants and shallow-rooted plants, you'll see that the, usually often the plants that are best suited for that ground will take over. So even though you planted seven things and this many pounds of each, the result you get is often sort of what the soil needs or, or responds with the best. And that's sort of how we treat the farm. I know it sounds sort of not scientific, like, well, you want to treat with rye or wheat, We've found that using a really diverse blend of crops, um, it, it, it creates a very good result. And if, it went, for example, we planted this blend, and on some of our fields, we noticed that the peas and oats did great, and the radishes didn't do great. And then on other fields, we noticed that our tillage radishes did wonderfully, um, and that our peas weren't so great. And I'm expecting that to change you know, with each year. I, I don't expect the same results. You can also fine-tune it so that if you, um, if you have a specific garden rotation plan and say you wanted to try doing some no-till tomatoes, then you would plant something like a rye and vetch in that spot and you'd, get, you'd either cut that down or it's, there aren't really many small-scale rollers available. So I would suggest sort of you can often wait for it to almost be mature inside it or you can, you can weed whack it and, and do a little tillage. You know, so that's a tricky thing where this system of rolling and crimping I'm showing you is really applicable to larger scale grain fields and to some row crop vegetables. Um, but in gardening, it's, it's a tricky challenge. One thing I, a friend of mine does in their garden is in order to, to make the rolling and crimping, they actually har they always have a cover crop section of their garden and they harvest that with a scythe and then they mulch that down into their plants. And it, uh, so there's often little things like that. And if you're growing lettuce, well, we're going to have to till. Uh, it's, it's, I haven't found a no-till lettuce yet. So it's, um, but I, my main suggestion would be to get a really, um, a very good cover crop blend going. And the main decision I'd focus on is, do you want that cover crop to be alive in the spring or dead? So you could either do a winter kill or you could do one that would overwinter. And even if you do an overwinter, I'd suggest putting some things in the winter kill, especially radishes. As they do a, we, we grow a long rooted radish, looks like a daikon, and it um, does a great job of decompacting soil because it goes very deep into the ground, it makes space for itself, and then it dies and, and leaves a long hole, and the soil sort of refills that hole, and in doing so, you get lots of fracture lines, and, and, uh, and the radish itself pulls a lot of nutrient up. It's such a fast grower, it mines nutrient, and then when it dies in the spring as it's decomposing, we've noticed that our rye and vetches do much better with those dead radishes. Was it native to Japan? The, the radishes, I think, I believe, are mostly native to Japan. Um, but these ones, I get them from Minnesota. I know they're not, I know they're not, native, to, they're not native to Minnesota. And the Federal Farm Program has a program to incentives for cover crop Mm -hmm. planting with conventional no-till. Exactly. Now, how does that play out? Uh, do they recommend a cover crop that winter kill or a cover crop that you go back to your herbicide uh, kill? They mostly are promoting just that. Um, for them, since they have herbicides at their disposal, you're able to kill them very quickly and often plant the same day. But some very, there. I don't know if any of you are really interested in this, there's a, a fellow named Ray Archuleta who works for the NRCS, A-R-C-H-U-L-E-T-A. And he's done a phenomenal job of introducing cover crop blends to conventional farmers around the country. And what most of them are using cover crop blends that overwinter, so that come spring they're able to fix some nitrogen for their, for their crop. But what, they're find, what most farmers doing is they're finding is they're able to drastically reduce or eliminate their need for nitrogen inputs and they're also finding that due to that high biomass in the cover crop, they're able to limit their herbicide usage for many of these farms using a lot of cover crops is going down, um, which has been, which economically makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a, 
there are several conventional farmers. Some of them are barely conventional anymore because they very they've, they've got they've find you very rarely have to use or intervene with any any herbicides. One that you could look into is named Gabe Brown in South Dakota, and they've integrated there for almost organic. But he now if he has a real issue come up where we would respond with tillage. He feels tillage is, is, and I understand his argument is more evil than a, a you know an application of herbicide once every third to fourth year. We would have our differences there, but I I still respect what he's doing um, from a perspective of showing a model of conventional farming that's simply more profitable based on a, a drastic reduction in inputs. Um, so that's really what the federal government is. They're saying, hey, this stuff it it di kills off very easily with your herbicide and provides you with these benefits. I would personally. I personally feel like our federal cover crop, crop program should start to take in that if we ever recognize soil as a carbon sink, I think we could have a, a whole uh, a system incentivized in a completely different way. But um, but I do think it's a good start. And Ray Archuleta has done a wonderful job of um, of, bring, of show, demonstrating several cover crop blends. Um, and there's a farmer I'm thinking of in Ohio, in Ohio who has a website. Who's a conventional farmer, but he's he displays all the data of how how much he's been able to reduce his um, nitrogen costs or herbicide <coughs> costs, and also in drought years he's had much higher yields than several of his conventional neighbors. Um, so there's a big part of this system is if you if you think about it, all the all those old roots in the ground that we were talking about earlier, they them being there, they break down. And as they break down, they provide nutrient, and that organic matter is more likely to stay in the soil than organic matter added to the top. Um, I've farmed my whole life, but it's really, I've always, I always was wondering, they say organic matter comes from this layer of mulch on the top of the ground, but how does it get down, get down there? And the truth is that most of this crop will re-oxidize you know, as that breaks down. The carbon molecules in those plants are going to join with oxygen molecules in the air and go up as CO2. And that a lot of our actual carbon capture comes from the roots themselves breaking down into the soil and the exudates from the plant when it's alive. So those carbohydrates form in photosynthesis. Like all energy transfers, plants aren't 100% efficient. They don't take all of those to build themselves. A lot goes back through the root. So it the uh, the Cover crops are fundamentally essential to really reviving our the, the first basic steps of our soil uh, our soil cap carbon capture again. And if you think of the whole world in terms of all the farmland that goes blank or dead for a time, it's almost it's I look at it and we look at it as a huge opportunity to make it green and photosynthesize and, and bring carbon back down. It's a very basic concept, but it seems to be lost on our leaders. <laughs> yeah. Our topsoil ranges from 7 inches to 24 inches, depending on the field and soil type. And then on a lot of our rolling ridges, we're in an area that the Dutch started to settle over 300 years ago. So some fields have been, have been farmed to near death, I would say. We have some rolls where our topsoil is really, really thin. Um, and we're actually putting some of those areas back into perennials now, into hay and pasture, just to hold that soil and to try to build it up over time. And um, and then we have some fields that are flat enough that they haven't had much erosion over all these hundreds of years of, of man's influence. So. Mm -hmm. would, would you, in a small garden, would you leave the tomato roots in the, in the dirt uh, instead of growing? Tomatoes, I would actually pull. Okay. And I would do well, that because the tomatoes can attract and carry a lot of disease, especially in these last seven years we've had the tomato blight come in and they can leave in a if especially if you don't have a full cover crop rotation going the tomato itself I would put in the compost and if you have a matured compost the compost will will deal with and, and break down a lot of the potential harmful fungi and bacteria that you could bring with them by leaving it. Can you give an example of what you want to do like roots or peas or so? That's a great question. Peas, I'm, I'm a big fan of legumes as far as their nitrogen fixing oh. capability. So I often, um, like my mother, she'll grow peas in her garden 
for the peas, but also as a cover crop. And sometimes to force the peas to fix a little extra nitrogen, so sprinkle some oats in with them, a very maybe 10% oats. Because when you put another crop with a legume, that competition forces the legume to produce even more nitrogen. So it's actually better for your soil. I've been a, that's one study I've looked at is if you planted, for example, a straight field of vetch, which is our major sort of our nitrogen workhorse for growing corn, and then you planted one blended um, with crops that require nitrogen, you get a total of much more total nitrogen by blending it because you've by creating that demand for the nitrogen, the rhizobia and the root modules they sort of perform to demand. So the um, I feel it's very important again to get um, like with a pea, I would leave that and I would maybe add a try try adding another little oats or something with it. Not so much that it becomes that they take over and you don't you can't get to your peas, but um, and then for a lot of crops are. It's really the crops that carry heavy diseases, um, cucurbits, tomatoes, and peppers. I tend to like to remove that matter, compost it. What was the first thing you said? Cucurbits, like cucumbers, oh. and squashes, zucchinis, that kind of thing. So they're often, they're often plants that just can attract and carry a lot of disease. I like to remove, compost, and where they were, plant to cover crop. There are some other I, you know, I leave beans, I'll leave, um, I used to grow a lot of salad greens and I would, I would always, for my late crops of salad greens, I would stop planting cover crops at September 15th and for all the salad I harvested late, I would leave it just because the, I, I wanted the soil covered a little bit. Uh, but it's often really a decision, if you're leaving it really, if, in my opinion, if you went too late to plant a cover crop. So often what I would suggest with as your tomatoes and eggplants or peppers start to get to the late part of their season, I'd scratch the cover crop you want right under them while they're still growing. Harvest your last ones and take the plant off. Um, and, and I'd even suggest that with really most vegetable crops. You're, it's more ideal to get a cover crop in than to leave it. But if you have to and it's late, I'd leave most things except save for tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. And again, this is just me. I, I, I mean, that isn't scientific guaranteed information, but this is how, how I would go about it. Someone else had a question, right, as you were asking the question. Well, I, I, um, one other thing I wanted to uh, just to touch on was that um, I, sort of, I touched on it earlier, but that we are, while we are transitioning to organic, um, we're doing it for reasons, not, not just to be sort of for business reasons. We're not looking at organic as a, yes, it does come with better income potential, but our main focus is organic in the real sense of the word, organic matter, as it relates to, to the carbon cycle. Um, so we're, we're really trying to run the farm organically in terms of re-understanding our carbon cycle and trying to work as a contributor, a positive contributor to our carbon cycle instead of a, a negative contributor where our carbon cycle is taking soil carbon and putting it in the air. Um, so that's a very important thing I explain to people a lot, uh, especially a lot of the conventional farmers in our county who say you're going organic and their understanding of organic is hippies and expensive. <laughs> so, so, for, um, so for us, it's, and that's not all, all of them, but some of our neighbors, that sort of is how it is. Uh, so we're, we're trying to explain it in terms of just what we're trying to do to the soil and, and how we're looking at our nutrient cycle. I, I don't know if that's a real subtle science, mm -hmm. but I even did a little bit of research and found that organic matter is less expensive for instance, mm -hmm. you could let the uh, rainforest grow up, mm -hmm. and so you sequester all the carbon. But eventually, things are going to start to rot. Exactly. It's going to disappear. Anyway. And so it's exactly I, that. I what that's a, it's a subtle science. It isn't subtle at all. It's very complicated because one, what we know is our sinks are greatly depleted, but when they hit capacity, and they're cycling will stabilize right. just for that. So once the rainforest has matured, then you have just as much dying as you're sequestering. Right. But the key is our soils around the world used to be more on the, on the matter of 10 to 20% organic matter. And we're now in America at two to 4% most of our soils. So we have a lot of excess capacity 
to refill those to refill those sinks before we stabilize at that point where we have just as much going out as coming in. One of the best books and um, leading leading scientists in this area um, is that is written by Tom Garreau, and it's called Geotherapy. And in that, he explains all the metrics in climate science of if we were to cut all our emissions, for example, to pre-industrial levels, how long it would take with our existing sinks to sequester them, and if we actually reinvigorated and maximized our soil, our you know soil carbon sinks and our forests, um, what our time frame? We actually have a hopeful time frame to to sequester our carbon dioxide. But it's a very good question. He addresses that really thoroughly. Uh, it's called geotherapy, and that's but that's a very it's not subtle at all. And in our in our studying in our studies, even when you roll in crimpa crop, like I was saying, a lot of that reoxidizes the CO two. So not only are we trying to make gains, but we're trying to stabilize that soil carbon into forms more forms more like glomalin, as opposed to immature forms of organic matter that could quickly reoxidize. <clears throat> I, you know, it's a very cautionary well I if you look at other examples we can see farms that have brought their organic matter from two percent to eight percent in the last 20 years one percent of organic matter increase on one acre is 22 tons of co2 no matter how you cut the pie that that if you're increasing your soil organic matter it's coming from the air unless you're dumping loads and loads of compost on. So you, overall, your net gain is there's, I think there's very solid evidence and proof that you can get there, but at a certain point, you do hit a carrying capacity of that given soil or that given forest, and then you're even. Or example, in a drought year in the Amazon, the forest itself can be a net emitter, but overall, they're, they sequester lots of carbon. Go ahead. In a country where they have consistently plant the same crop like rice paddies, uh, what would you say about, the, is, does that need to be changed or is it that they put nitesoil or they, they fertilize enough so that they can go rice, 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 or should they rotate their crop? Um, I, mean, I don't think they will. <laughs> well, there, that's a, a very complicated issue that I don't know tons about rice paddy culture. Um, however, there were, have been lots of lots of rice paddy systems that were very viable and sort of long-term stable in terms of their nutrient cycles. Um, as in most of Southeast Asia, they're, the way they grew rice up until the introduction of synthetic fertilizers was pretty stable and went well long-term. So I don't know very much about that, though. Um, and there's certainly arguments that rice paddies let a lot of methane out. And I... I can't remember all the way back to when I was in college, but we did a study on um, a rice paddy that how it were how it functioned before the introduction of synthetic fertilizers and after. And I remember it being a tale of how the rice paddies went from being quite stable to very unstable. But I don't know much about that. Um, is part of what your farm does is it try to educate other farmers to convince them to do it? We we show farmers if we're interested, but we're not trying to push it on anybody. So we, we actually have a couple neighbors who are starting to grow some organic grain. And I had a conventional farm who, um, who came and visited us, a pretty large dairy, interested in starting to, to go to a no-till, more like an organic system, but not all the way. So it's starting to rub off on folks. Mm -hmm. So the organic, the organic in terms of the type of produce, yeah. is, that side of it has a, that side of it been a benefit to you in terms of marketing? Exactly, it's much more valuable than, okay, so it yeah, it has been an economic benefit in a big way. Um, so what is the farm like? It's just, how big is it and how, what percentage of it is all these fields? And then you have livestock mm -hmm. and the uh, vegetables. We, we don't do vegetables, but okay. we, uh, so it, it? it's 2,200 acres. And there's actually a related farm we're managing, so it's overall 2,600 acres. 1,400 acres of it is grain, and 600 of it is pasture and hay, and the remaining 800 acres is in forest. And most of the land is flat or lightly rolling. Uh, there's some areas that are, you know, a little steep, um, especially going down to some stream beds. Are you doing heirloom grain, like spelt? We're planting some spelt. Uh, we're also trialing a little bit of amaranth einkorn, 
which are very, very old grains um, from, the, from the Fertile Crescent, actually. And we're getting those varieties out of Denmark, where they've had a big revival in those grains. Um, we're also trying a little bit of flax um, to grow flax meal and some sunflowers, which are alternative sources of protein to soybeans. Uh, there's a pretty big demand for soy-free feed and, um, and a lot of questions about the, the health of soybeans. So we're, we're really looking at other sources of, uh, of protein for our animal feeds. And the flax and sunflowers are sort of our first trials in that direction. So mm -hmm. have you eliminated um, the Monsanto? Oh yeah, to go, yeah. that's the first step to transitioning your game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. You're, um, you're, they're in, in going to organic. Right. You have to grow using organic techniques, certified organic inputs or techniques for three whole years since the last application of anything prohibited and all up to so far, and hopefully it continues, um, no GM crops are allowed in organic production. So there's certainly a group trying to push them into the organic standard, at which point I'll be done with the organic standard. But there's, there's, a, there's a big effort there. So. Did you just mention the fertile crescent? Yeah, there's two... The, the uh, tigers and the Euphrates? Yeah, there are some, some of the ancient grains, like the precursors to wheat emmer. That's where it is. Come, came, from, came from what is now Syria, yeah. as, as far as I know. It's 5,000-year-old five, 5, history. Um, but now it's being grown with great success in Germany and Denmark, and it's been reintroduced to the states. Is the and Fertile Crescent flooded still? I, 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 from what I know, the Fertile Crescent is in a big mess right now. But, but, so I, I don't, I don't know how they, how they're farming over there so much right now. <laughs> I do know that. Um, Prior to the uprising in Syria, they had a massive drought, and that there were about a, a million farmers who didn't, f whose crops failed that year, and it led to ref a refugee crisis that then led to protests and others. Um, I'm hearing that the research on those older grains mm -hmm. that they had then had the allergies, and that a lot of, you know, the allergies that of, you know, tweet etc. have to do with the fact that you know we have modified them so much There's, and then yeah. when we go back to the original spelt and, and the, you know the others that that they digest differently they there is a lot of research to support that and we've bred wheat really with one focus in mind for a hundred years and that's just been yield um, so by by sort of losing our we don't quantify we don't value food by healthy uh, how healthy it is or how nutrient how much riboflavin or how much methionine or how much thiamine or how much vitamin B or C it has, we, we value it by how much it costs per pound. I mean, that's sort of our system is run on corn and soy. So in our wheat, um, not only have we bred it that way, there's also evidence emerging that um, Roundup is used widely to kill down wheat so it can be harvested all at once. So some we in our wheat fields wait until all of it's dry enough. Um, a widespread practice in America is to spray Roundup, an active ingredient is glyphosate, directly onto wheat to kill it down evenly, and then you harvest it. And if you think about it, that's a direct shot of glyphosate onto your food. And I don't know if any of you have looked at the studies, but glyphosate is um, an antibiotic and a metal chelator. So if you get that in your guts, you, it's an issue. So that's, um, that's also a widespread practice with the American potato crop. Uh, to get it killed down and evenly. So if you think about an application of glyphosate right onto your potato while it's still alive, all of that goes down and collects into the tuber. So I'm not not directly laying the, the problem there, but um, that's a practice that's very alarming, and it's a direct application of glyphosate to our potato and wheat crops. So there's there are some studies checking out whether the increasing gluten intolerance is actually related to the fact that a, a large portion of our wheat has glyphosate all over it. Make some more money, man. <laughs> but it's been, yeah, it's, um, there's, a, I met two people making a documentary about it, trying to get an idea of how widespread the practice is, but some estimates say that up to 50% of our wheat crop is sprayed with glyphosate to kill it down. And you can combine it a little earlier, and, um, well, you can also use others. You could use 2,4-D or any other other herbicides. But Roundup is so popular. It is. 
Yes. Um, okay, and I think we're actually going to have to okay. you know, wrap it up. It's about 7 o'clock. We want to let Ben get home because he has a decent drive ahead of us. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm sorry if I didn't bore you all to death.